My name's Naomi Stead and I'm a professor and the head of the Department of Architecture at Monash University and this series, Light at the End of the Tunnel, is an ongoing collaboration between Monash Architecture and Parlour. As always, uh, we begin by with an acknowledgement of country, um, acknowledging the people of the Greater Kulin Nations who are, who are the traditional custodians of the land that Monash University is located on, although of course um, this group is located all the way across Australia and all the way across <laughs> Victoria. Uh, so we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country all across Australia's many nations and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and to Indigenous Australians who are part of the Parla community. This uh, seminar is the sixth in our Light at the End of the Tunnel series, which is looking specifically at architecture as a profession, discipline and practice and how it will be affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the first five sessions have been a kind of combination of some big picture scene setting discussions, uh, looking at where we are now and where we can expect to go from here. And also some more specific detailed sessions uh, which where we've tried to have focused advice for particular groups. And the first of them really was last week's foot in the door session, which was really aimed at um, students, new graduates and people who had um, left the profession for one reason or another uh, and wanted to get back in. So our speakers over the past five weeks have been Misty Waters, uh, Helen Lockhead, Jess Murphy, uh, the session on leadership a couple of weeks back with Eloise Atkinson and Adam Haddo, Last week's Foot in the Door session had guests Chi Mellum and Ryan Barton. And this week, um, I'm very pleased to say that our guest is Kate Doyle, CEO of the Architects Accreditation Council of Australia, or AACA, uh, who will be focusing on the issue and indeed the benefits of registration. Justine is going to introduce Kate in a second, but first, as always, let me run through the protocols of the session. Um, please make sure your microphone is on mute. Everybody's is. Thank you very much. Uh, if you are willing and able, uh, we do invite you to leave your camera on because it's kind of nice to be able to see everyone else's face. Um, and this is a community event, so um, there is definitely a sense of solidarity when you can see other people's presence. Um, the format, as you know, is a QA. and a It's meant to be informal but informative. Uh, Justine and I will ask questions to keep things moving, but we'll also take questions from the floor throughout. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat function uh, and we'll ask people to put their questions live. So turn on your camera, turn off your mute microphone and ask your question to Kate live. Um, please also feel free to add your own observations and experiences into the chat. Um, we've, we have found that to be really um, a kind of unexpected pleasure of this series that uh, people are adding their own elaborations and uh, experiences in the chat um, and I will be really fascinated to see what comes out of this particular one around issues of registration. We won't get to all of your questions every week we have some fantastic questions which unfortunately we just don't have time to get to but they will help to inform the, the sub topics of subsequent sessions. Now I'm going to hand over to Justine who will introduce Kate. Hi everybody, nice to see you all again. Um, as Naomi said, we're turning our attention to registration today. Um, and I just thought I'd say a few things quickly about registration before um, I introduce the fabulous Kate Doyle. Um, so of course, we all know that here in Australia, you need to be registered to call yourself an architect. Um, Architects Acts uh, differ slightly from state to state, but as far as I understand, they are all kind of framed in terms of consumer protection. But within the kind of wider culture of architecture, registration has taken on a much bigger role. Um, it's also a matter of identity and it's often used as a gateway to participation in kind of all areas of, or many areas of the discipline. So it's kind of um, has a sort of um, um, uh, role that's well beyond the design and delivery of buildings. Um, registration really matters as a qualification, particularly for women. There's lots and lots of evidence from outside of our profession that credentials are much more significant in terms of the career progression of women. And if, within architecture, becoming registered is really one of the biggest credentials that we can, that, that, that we have. Um, registration is also really important for measuring participation. And uh, one of the most frequently quoted statistics all across the world that have a kind of registration system 
when discussing women in architecture is that big gap between the, the, the gap between the graduation rates of women and the registration rates. Um, and there's a lot we could say about that, which we may or may not get to. Um, and to our colleague, Jill Matthewson, who many of you will know is our data diva, as she calls herself, um, in 2012 undertook analysis of the Australian census. And that showed that at that time, there were twice as many women active in Australian architecture as there were women who were registered architects. So there was this huge group of women who were really involved in the profession who identified with it, but were not registered. Um, Jill's late, more recent analysis has shown that um, in those intervening years, the numbers of women becoming registered in Australia have really skyrocketed um, to the extent that all of the growth on the registered registers can be um, accounted for by, by the registration of women. And, and we really see this as partly a matter of women taking issues of representation and equity into their own hands, getting registered as something they can, you know, we can do. Well, not me, but you know, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> So registration, I guess, matters in lots and lots of ways. And it's really, so we're very pleased to have Kate here to discuss this with us and to talk specifically about the pathways that one might take to registration. Kate's um, had a, a long-term interest in encouraging women to complete their registration. And today, I think we're also going to ask some questions back to the audience. Um, usually we have the audience asking our speakers questions, but I think Kate will also, is very keen to use this as an opportunity to, um, gather you know, information about what people need um, to support them through and into and through the registration process. So I just, now I get to introduce Kate. Kate is a great friend to Paula and I'd say to me personally, Kate is very aware of equity issues and how this can play out in regulatory environments. And one of the things I really appreciate most about her is that I think we come from slightly different perspectives about registration sometimes, but she's always up for a very robust discussion and I really appreciate and value that. Um, and she's just really fun to hang out with. So <laughs> we like to have our friends on, anyway, off the topic. Okay, so Kate is the CEO of the Architects Accreditation Council of Australia. She has extensive experience in program development and education, competency-based assessment and professional regulatory regulation contexts. She has held leadership roles at both state and federal levels um, for various bodies in the not-for-profit sector. She has more than 12 years experience in architecture um, and previously was the registrar in the New South Wales Architects Registration Board. So welcome, Kate. We're very pleased to have you here. Um, I should also say that the um, AACA has, is contributing some funds to help support this event today. So we also really appreciate that because you know, we're, all of these things take time and money to make happen. So thank you for that. But let's get started with, I think, what the big question Kate would start with is why does registration matter? From your perspective, um, why, why should people go through this process of becoming registered? Kate, microphone. I'll leave the gender issue for, for a moment, if I may. And can I first say, um, well, thank you very much for um, inviting me to come along today. And um, I had actually um, talked about supporting this before Justine asked me to be a speaker. So it wasn't like, I'll give you two, I'll give you uh, some support if I can speak. Oh, but yeah. um, so, <laughs> um, I really, um, uh, but it is really good, as Justin says, you know, we've, um, we've had a number of discussions over many years across many contexts in terms of um, what this actually means. And I, I think that what, what it actually means to be registered as an architect, and I think we really have to go back and we, we all acknowledge that there are numerous um, ways of contributing to architecture. There are numerous, you know, sort of levels of expertise, what, what people are doing. So it, it, the field of architecture has meaning well outside individual buildings and individual and, and spaces. Um, but having said that, so what does registration as an architect mean? And, and we go back then to, um, to government regulation and government regulation of professions. And, and which is essentially about um, consumer protection. So whilst um, some architects still think that um, architects acts are about um, protecting the right of architects to 
architects as in those persons on the register to use the title architect. Um, it really is about um, 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 having, opp having an opportunity to know who is the who is the um, um, an appropriate person to be involved in the very um, serious and sometimes risky business of um, designing, uh, designing, uh, managing delivery, um, uh, working with clients, working with the community on um, on buildings. So it's no it's no accident that. Um, I would think, and this is my figure, I can't, it's very hard to base it on, um, on um, data, but I would think that probably 95% of, um, of the public buildings, um, commercial buildings, um, in those buildings that are important to the community, to, to people who have no, wouldn't even um, have any idea about really what architecture in itself means, um, would be actually designed by those people who have professional education, professional experience, um, and are practicing in that space. So it is not, I think sometimes it's really easy to come from the point of um, it being um, exclusive and, and um, trying to keep people out. Um, I like to see it the other way. It's actually about making sure that the appropriately qualified and experienced person is being responsible for um, for the, um, the for the design um, pro and, and delivery of of buildings because they are not only important in terms of um, from a, um, a business perspective, but as um, Justine touched on, architecture is incredibly important in terms of um, providing shelter for. Uh, fundamentally at that point of um, um, being a point of shelter, but also being great pointers to, to the values of a society. What do we value in our society? What does that, what does that actually mean? Our historic, where did we come from? Our history, etc. Now we could spend the whole session um, looking at that, but I just thought I'd, I'd pose that it's actually, I think if we look at, if we look at um, reg registration and what the purpose of it is, rather than it being a means of keeping people out, I think another problematic area in terms of um, the perception is that um, uh, many people on the most people probably on the on the call today um, would have um, a qualification in architecture. They've completed what would be what I would term you know professional education in in architecture. At the end of the point of graduation, they are not legally, and there are provisions in each act in the country. In, in each state and territory around the country to, um, to restrict a person from using um, that title. And again, that goes back to the purpose of, well, are they actually in the practicing space? So for example, if a person who um, is, has an academic um, qualification in architecture and then has, a, has, um, has an academic career in architecture, uh, and there's been the point of why can't we have, you know, sort of a non, you know, sort of non-accredited um, architects who are practicing in architectural education. Well, the point is not about, that's a different level of regulation. We're actually looking about what is the regulation and consumer protection in that space. I think Justine very, very clearly um, summarised um, and it's really a, um, of the great work that Parla has been doing since in inception. It's made it very easy for, um, it's sort of taken away a lot of the, um, I can recall some discussions I had in the, my early years as a registrar at the New South Wales Board and coming not from the architecture profession, being quite horrified and if not amazed, amazed and a bit horrified that there was this whole cohort of women who I just assumed were architects. They were providing architectural services. They were often co-owners or directors or principals in practice. But when it comes to the legal um, restriction, they were not architects. And I think it goes to that, to a number of things. Um, the fact that the title is protected, not the practice. And Australia, um, along with New Zealand um, and the UK, are probably three of the only, um, you know, sort of, uh, um, countries in the world, nations in the world, that don't actually have some kind of restriction um, to practice. There are some, some very minor, when I say very minor in, the, in terms of a national perspective, restrictions to practice. And I don't want to go into that space at the moment because I think we, we want to focus on something else today. 
So I think it's needed because if you want to practice as, as an architect, get registered. I, I just think, I just can't understand um, why you wouldn't want to do that now. That's a desire to do that and wanting to do that and, a, and an aim to do that is different then to what are the barriers and what can actually um, stand in the way. And again, you know, Parler has been very, um, has published some, you know, fantastic and accessible and interesting and and just the whole parlor package I think is um, um, is is really fantastic because it actually um, comes from the personal uh, as well as from the data end and I think that that's a really that that is very important when winning hearts and minds and it's not winning the hearts and minds of men particularly I'm more concerned about winning the hearts and minds of women to say yeah hey I'm in this space. I might, um, I, I want to make sure that I have the opportunity to take any role that might come to me because I have, um, I, I'm not looking at a, a barrier, oh, I'm not an architect. So you can be restricted from submitting for competitions. Many competitions require registration as an architect. Certainly in, um, uh, there are most, many, many governments, I should I'll be careful here, many governments around the country require a person submitting for various building um, for tenders in various building types require the person to be um, a registered architect um, and the 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 other thing is also um, in terms of the what's actually actually happening in practice I know, I know there are certain um, there are a number of um, uh, firms around the country that actually have a positive um, uh, uh, sort of policy that says you can't get past a certain level in the firm without being um, registered. Now, those, to my my experience, and I'm talking hearsay here, my experience, that's really probably only been, I would think, in the last five to ten years that, that people have been thinking about that. And they're thinking about that from a no, number of reasons. It's about how are they um, presenting themselves, you know, um, in some cases, you know, I can think of some cases, uh, you know, I'm sort of a little bit further out of this space now, but as a registrar there, some firms who had, you know, maybe um, you know, a very low proportion of senior practitioners in their practice who were registered architects. And I, don't, I think that is actually really changing and has changed particularly so in the last um, five years. So I think that inside the architectural workforce, I think there's a higher um, importance placed upon um, um, becoming um, an architect and then as I said individual firms um, <clears throat> um, sort of have those um, have those policies as well I don't want to go too much because I as Justin says I want to ask the question so I think I'll stop there and then I'll come back to some of I'm sure that some of the questions that people will ask will allow me to reflect upon the particular barriers that I see and how they're grouped so um, um... Um, if anyone, I mean, the chat's pretty quiet at the moment. If you've got questions for Kate, please put them in there. I mean, I, I suppose the next question really is that, um, you know, I know you've done a lot of work in, in recent years to develop um, a range of pathways for registration. Mm -hmm. I think traditionally there was one thing. Mm -hmm. You've done a lot of work in recent years to um, enable those from overseas to kind of into a smoother pathway and you've also got the experienced practitioner pathway so I wonder if you might just talk a little bit about um, and I presume you've got those different pathways because you were finding that those cohorts were experiencing barriers through the yeah through the established um, absolutely APA. so I wonder if you might talk uh, briefly about those um, sure sure um, just briefly, because all of this information is on our is on our website. Um, but the so the the majority of architects in Australia are educated in Australia in one of the nineteen um, programs now nineteen programs soon to be a few more um, have have completed the architecture practice exam and then applied for registration in this, in, in the state or territory. Australia has an active um, uh, skills migration policy, so therefore we see a lot of um, we see a lot of um, international um, graduates, architecture graduates and international uh, and architects who are um, experienced architects from their home jurisdiction coming into Australia. And up until um, three years ago, there was really the pathway that people had to go through was that they had to, had to have their overseas qualification recognised. 
and then if it didn't if it didn't fit the absolutely neat pattern of five years or equivalent to five years, which is our model in Australia, then they were, they had to go and do some sort of top up study. Just the idea of being able to do the top up study, it was a really big barrier because my, and increasingly, you, you know, we didn't actually ask universities what they thought about that. How do people actually get in to do, how could they possibly get in to do this study without having to be, having to have a whole lot of prerequisites, having to do a whole lot of other things. So there's a whole lot of other baggage that attached to that. So that was a disincentive. Um, in terms then of um, the people, so, and I'll just use the example of, because it's the most common example of um, uh, German graduates, graduates from German graduates, graduates from a German university, um, up until about 2010, the, one of the most common um, architecture qualifications was the four year, was a four year qualification. And that allowed the person to move through the path to registration. So we, we looked at things, instead of saying, we've got to have this really quick smooth and different special pathway. We looked at our national benchmark for the national standard of competency. We looked at how, what performance criteria we were bench, benchmarked against that. And we said, okay, well, if we actually, if we can actually deal with the five year, the four year qualification, because we know competency is, does not finish at the end of the professional um, education. So we now, um, people who have um, a, a less than five year qualification, which was the, um, program in their home country when they graduated that allowed them to register as an architect then they're welcome to come through our combined pathway and do the architecture practice exam or if they are eligible to do the experienced practitioner. The experienced practitioner is the other um, model that was, came into being in 2018 and that was um, and remember all of these things don't doesn't rely on the double ACA having a good idea and doing it it relies upon working in collaboration with eight jurisdictions so so it's a it is a it's complex world um, and it works on on collaboration because mutual recognition is incredibly important it's in architects shouldn't have to be um, you know go through another testing regime to move from state to state etc um, hey, hey yep. sorry can I just break in for a second there we've got um, we've got a, a hot run of questions in the chat uh, I'm going to invite Ilana Razbash to Razbash to um, your question Ilana uh, Hello, thanks for the question. Um, it's, yeah, it's something we really hear often, especially, you know, when students get that minimum one year pre-graduation experience and then we're on track and our logbook is going well and we want to register the year following so we get our one year post-graduation. And then we, we feel confident we're on track, but the cacophony is saying, don't register too soon, don't go for it too soon. But you, you know you're ready or getting there and you're on schedule and your mentors are saying the same thing, but the general consensus starts from the point of sort of judging, oh, you're too young. So could you, could you maybe say some more about that and offer some yeah. advice to... I think that that's... Um, yeah. Possible? Thanks, Lana. That's a really good question because it allows me to flick onto another barrier that I think is there. So we've got the barriers of, you know, what the rules are, the, what the rules of the um, program are, and then what the rules that people have either put on themselves or are put on them by or um, through their peers or their colleagues. Um, there is a, uh, there may well be a consensus that, um, I mean, if we, if we actually have a look at the majority of candidates coming through to the um, APE, it would generally be um, in the last five years or so. We know it's generally within the, uh, um, within three to five years, probably more around the four to five years post um, graduation. There is a reason why the the the, um, the 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 requirement says that you must have um, you can have you can log material log um, experience beforehand, because there's been a long tradition, probably less um, less so now, a long tradition of people working through their through their um, architectural education. Particularly, there was that very traditional to have that gap between um, um, between the fir the first degree and the and the second degree. So I don't know who's telling you that. Did, did a registrar of a board tell you that, Alana? Did someone in your, did your peers tell you that? Did your boss tell you that? I think in terms of who you, who you should listen to, you should listen to yourself. You should look at what I have, a look at my, um, the requirements in, for the logbook. 
You should talk to your um, um, supervisor and people who are working with you and um, helping you through this and ask for their opinion. And I think that's how you, how you should be deciding when you should submit to your, um, submit your application for the APE. I and I think this is a really good, good example of how, um, what, what is it, what's a barrier? What's a barrier that is a, um, and barriers are barriers, you know? So but are they a barrier that a, a candidate has placed upon themselves or an applicant has placed upon themselves or because of they've heard something or, or, or peer report? But it's really thinking about, are you ready? And you can check that, are you ready to apply for registration through doing your own self-assessment by talking to your supervisors and your colleagues in your workplace and go for it. Maybe we'll just stay on this theme for a bit longer because Tess O'Mara also has a good um, observation to make on the same topic. So Tess, do you want to put your question? Yeah, sure. I was just um, sort of following on from Alana's comment. I think generally the consensus or the sort of talk of the town is when you're telling people you're thinking about registration is don't rush it. Um, it's onerous, it take, you know, it's really hard, just don't rush into it, you've only just finished uni. Um, and I think then that mentality sort of leads to having peers or people in the workplace who are sort of the next step above you. And when you anecdotally ask them their registration experience, they've usually done it at around the five year mark, which I think essentially just leads to this perception where if you do it in two or three years, you feel like you're doing it really early and you feel like you're sort of taking a bit of a risk doing it? Mm. Mm. Um, well, I think that uh, that's, that's um, interesting and maybe in terms of then, because one of the things that I did want to talk about today is so what, what are we going to do about these issues that are, that are raised, you know? So, and I think there's maybe some work there to maybe we talk about to the Pals and Park um, coordinators as well, because I think they have the Pals and Park are two of the, ma the main, um, you know, sort of pre-registration support programs that are available to APE candidates. Um, I think that, and I, I, I get what you're saying, Tess, people will always give you advice. And people, um, I would say that you actually have to listen to advice and then you have to temper that with your, you know, again, back, back to your own um, experience. Tess, can I ask you are, are you, are you reflecting on your experience yourself or you're thinking yeah. about this? I, I'm actually with a couple of friends doing my registration, undertaking the process at the moment. And I yep. think when we sort of started to think about, you know, do we do it now? Do we do it next intake? We asked around and found this was a pretty common theme. And yep. I think maybe in terms of how it, how it I think personally it relates to gender, I have definitely noticed that amongst the um, women in the group who are undertaking registration, it's sort of this feeling that registration, you know, you've made it through university, you're sort of successfully going along in your early career and, you know, holding it together. And it is that feeling of imposter syndrome and registration. Yeah. I think, um, Sorry, I've just lost the um, the sound of um, Tess there. Can people hear me? Can you yeah, hear yeah. me? Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah. Um, I think um, I think then we go back to those broader issues that again gender has um, uh, gender, you know, feelings that are across you know um, women's um, endeavours in 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 all fields about that imposter syndrome. I think that you have to listen to the right voices. And I think that you um, listen to the voices in yourself, listen to, you know, um, benchmark yourself, if you like. And I'm not saying um, against males, I'm talking about benchmarking yourself against other other graduates in your firm, other, you know, your peers outside. And I, I just think it's, um, you know, you just have to kind of, you know, that, that internal clock that says no because people are giving it's it's sage advice to say make sure you're ready when you go because you don't want to be disappointed that's good advice but that can mean very different things to that will mean a different um perception for each, each self self you know sort of um self-assessment that is required by each um, individual candidate and i think that that goes for all of our programs not just that I'm quite surprised to hear that people are saying that, I have to say, because we've generally, we generally think 
based having heard the experiences of many people over the years who, who have delayed getting registered and then find it incredibly difficult to do once all sorts of other responsibilities start piling up as well. Yeah. You know, one of those is children, if you were to have children. Um, so we, on the whole, tend to say, get registered as fast as you can. Like, just get, mm -hmm. get that qualification and yeah. keep moving. Um, so I'm a bit alarmed to hear that you go. Well, I mean, obviously, it's not a universal experience because even just here, we've got Sarah Burge um, observing that her experience has been completely the opposite. Um, did, do you want to make that point, Sarah? Uh, yeah, so I'm from a slightly smaller firm, um, but all the way through, um, I suppose, my working career, I've been encouraged by both of my directors to um, you know, get registered, look at what your competencies are, is there anything that they could do to help me fulfil what the competencies, competencies were that I needed? Um, and I suppose in the back of my mind as well, and I suppose it's, it's not strictly related to being a female in the industry, but I can see how busy the women around me are and they've got children, they've got families. I didn't want to be getting to the point where I just had so much going on in my life and it was overwhelming. So getting it done, getting it done with people that I went through uni with as well, being supported by them, made it a lot easier. And that was kind of how I was benchmarking myself. And I think a lot of it as well is, sure, the getting your hours up and your experience on site and all of that stuff is important. But a lot of it was learned from reading through the textbooks and the notes and things like that. And, yeah, and, and even within the office, like, there were things that I was reading through and was like, oh, I'm not quite sure about this. Might ask the office. And everyone in the office kind of went through and learnt that again because, yeah, there's so much to gain from still doing the study. It's not just the experience, but, yeah, that, that's been my experience, which is great. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, um, uh, so I, I agree with you, and I think, it, I think if this relates to... Um, that I and I've worked in, in, other, uh, in other professions as well, and... I think it is the very unusual case when a person who is more senior to you will actually discourage you from doing, from from making an attempt to um, to to follow a pathway. Um, they might give you some advice, and you listen to that advice. But I I really think that most I think most of the stories I hear are actually more at um, at of Sarah's. But unfortunately, like everything, bad news is um, easier to listen to. <laughs> And you can, and it's sort of it's um, you know sort of that whole syndrome we're all sometimes very um, um, prone to is listening to the to the negative rather than the positive. We need to think also about the pass rates for the architecture practice exam. This isn't an exam that we have you know sort of a pass rate over the last five years that is, it is sat and from nationally um, it is sat around the um, seventy to seventy five percent. Uh, I'm talking about the rate of a part a part three. So we're talking we're not talking about an exam that is um, incredibly difficult um, to pass. It takes time and effort to put to to, to get to that point. Um, but I think most people's experience has may sometimes it's surprised people as how much that they really appreciated going through that process and how much that they had actually learned through having to really focus on some of the, on, on, a, on the broad range of really focusing on practice of architecture issues that they might not necessarily be exposed to as a, as, as a reasonably, um, reasonably recent graduate. And I would say to everybody, I would, I, whenever I did a briefing in New South Wales as the um, registrar, I would say to all the candidates, regardless of their gender, do it within, do it within the first five years before before life gets in the way. Okay, um, so there's there's quite a lot of discussion here about the practitioner pathway as well. But Kate, I wondered if um, if you wanted to. So there's a lot going on here, but I wondered if you wanted to um, put the questions that you were interested in getting back on to our audience as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Justine. 
what I wanted to do was for people to really think about um, what are the barriers to them. I think, um, and are those barriers something that they can do something about? Do they have any agency on that? Um, and if not, who else could actually help them? Is it is it looking to, um, you know, sort of organisations like Parler to say, well, how can we, how can you maybe sort of advise people about how to, um, you know, sort of get together in some kinds of, you know, support groups to go through these um, programs? If it's something like, and something that we're actually starting to look at in the experience practitioner assessment, which has only been around for two years, is that we're starting to look at, um, and the experience practitioner says, well, I can stand that for a second because it does illustrate this point of where things can move and where things can't. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an immovability in, in a number of these programs and it is about, um, you know, sort of professional education um, and experience and can you actually meet the performance criteria and there's some flexibility in the way we can assess that. Um, but so in the experience practitioner assessment, and that can apply to a person with an Australian architectural qualification or a person with um, international qualification, um, and then having a portfolio of a complex projects behind them where they have had the executive, where they have had executive level experience. That means they've been a decision maker. It doesn't mean that they were called the project director. It means that they had responsibility for an aspect of work and work progressed based upon a decision they made. The problem is often for women when you look at in the last 10 years, particularly, you know, depending upon the age profile of, of the woman, um, because some, they might have been, might have built up uh, a portfolio of complex projects, uh, but that might have been uh, you know, sort of 15 years ago, because in the meantime, they then moved out, they might have moved out of that, the, that mode of practice, or they have might have moved into um, different responsibilities within a firm. So we're looking at how, what is the kind of the, the pinch point of where and where the boards will agree, because remember, we need to go back to actually say, we need to have some flexibility here in this. And because, again, you know, we talk about, you know, the old thing about if cities were designed for, for be good for women and children, they'd be good for everybody. It's a bit like this. Anytime we actually come up, you know, look at some flexibility in this when we're looking at the particular um, um, barriers to, to women, it, it can apply to, to, to men as well, to other genders as well. So um, that, that's one of the things, that's an example of a barrier that we can actually do because we've actually noticed what's happening and we're always open to what um, people are saying. I noticed um, Nicole Harden's on the line and we've had a lot of discussions over the years about a number of their assessment um, um, programs as well. So we do listen um, and we try and, um, but we don't, you know, we, we really, we've, we've got to take in um, what is actually our responsibility that on the behalf of the boards, we actually have, have robust um, programs that will um, allow a person to get to registration as soon as they can. So you're interested to know what various people are experiencing. Exactly. And think there might be um, opportunities to adjust that. I yeah. wonder if we might throw to Lynn Varhol. Um, Lynn um, asked some questions that I asked in last week that I know is trying to find a way to get registered um, and, probably, and has, Lynn, you're there. You've been making quite a few yes. comments. Well, we'll try. Hi. Hi. Thanks very much, Justine. Good morning, Kate. Or good Hello. afternoon, I suppose it is out there. Um, I'm an experienced practitioner. Uh, my overseas training was done in South Africa. I graduated in 96, so I have over 20 years of experience with complex projects primarily. Um, but in the past three years, I've had a really hard time finding employment. And in fact, in the past three years, I've only had 12 months of employment, and that was part time. I was made redundant in July last year and haven't been able to secure any employment since. And as um, was highlighted in last week's um, discussion, a lot of that comes across because um, I apply for any position and a lot of the attitude I get is, oh, well, you're overqualified. We wouldn't feel confident hiring you because you're stuck in your ways, blah, 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 which, you know, frankly is nonsense when you when you're at my level and desperate to work, you will do anything. I mean, I've even worked for minimum wage, even though we're told, you know, you mustn't work for under the award uh, payment, but that's often not an option. So my question is, um, is there some flexibility possibly to 
the kind of work experience, like I've done some private work um, that could uh, increase my hours, um, but uh, one I've done some pro bono work, but I haven't had the full requirement of the 12 months of paid employment over the past three years. I have uh, in, in Australia over the past seven years, um, but as you mentioned, you mentioned that this um, pathway only started two years ago. So prior to that, I was just too swamped with work to even think about registration, quite honestly. Sure. Well, I think that um, the, the, the requirement in terms of the work, is, it's, a, it's a really good question, Fez. Thanks for, thanks for sharing your experience, because I think it, it is applicable across. And I just saw something flash up. Sorry, I'm working on my um, phone today because I had some problems with my computer. So if I look a bit sort of weird every now and then, it's because I can't see properly on the phone. However, um, I, mean, I think that it, the, the, requirements, the requirement to the EPA talks about relevant work, ex work experience. It doesn't talk about um, paid employment. Obviously, people take that to be employment and, the, and every, all the majority of um, applicants would actually, that's exactly how you would read it, that you're employed in an architectural office or you're employed in a related area. You might have been doing work in your own name, but it related to, um, to, to um, architectural services. So I think that there's, there's, there's of course, there's some flexibility there in terms of um, if you if you've done work in your own name and it relates to architectural services, it's a, it's what we're trying to um, make sure is that is that um, obviously a person who might have been in paid employment um, if for the last um, you know sort of ten years in Australia, but it wasn't architecture related, even though they might have had an extensive architecture career overseas, they wouldn't be eligible. Does that make sense? So it's not actually so certainly a variety of experience. Um, that is, you know, work in your own um, name, um, uh, pro bono work that you've done in design um, would all, would be covered up. And also that issue about the 12 months, we do um, talk, we talk about 12 months in the last um, three years to try and cater for the fact that it might not necessarily have been, um, you know, all within one calendar year. But I've got you, I've got, um, I've been actually, I'll, one of our programs, I will actually come back to you um, on this because um, this was, uh, just, Justin and I discussed this the other day because um, when we were talking about this program and I was talking about these sorts of things and she said, oh, there was a person last week who had a particular issue and um, I'm sure there might be a couple of other people on the, on the, on the web today who, who have that. So I've got your details. So um, Monica, the programs person, will come back to you about that situation. So it's a really good example of Yep, let's look at the whole situation, see how we can be um, how we can be flexible because the critical components of your experience um, providing architectural services in complex project is not an issue. It's just how it fits into you know the, the, the program guidelines. I wonder if we might throw to a question from Badru Ahmed has a question about um, colleagues being territorial. But also, just before we do that, Kate, we're getting a little bit of pro and it may be your audio. Do you mind just putting yourself on mute just for a second while we take um, Badru's question? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Sorry, I'm not in a state to turn on my video, but anyway, I think your voice is enough. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Just speak up a bit, Badru. You're a bit quiet. Uh, sorry, can you hear me better now? Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, um, so... Like I said, I think this is just a personal observation and I think this isn't talked so much because you are with your colleagues, you wouldn't necessarily bring that up in front of them. And sometimes I feel like many of them are very territorial, especially let's say someone has got one more year of experience than me. So we are essentially seeking the same kind of tasks. And sometimes those tasks are limited in the office and sometimes they can get territorial about it which I feel is very difficult to navigate because it can create a kind of negative environment if you bring it up. It's very hard to address it. And look, I'm not trying to bring the whole gender issue in, but sometimes you feel that around women sometimes more because I also understand maybe out of 10 seats in the top, only two of us will get there. So we have to fight amongst ourselves before we get there to take one of those two seats, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that's just my observation. And I'm an immigrant and I was an international student before. So this was my um, experience worldwide, really. 
and this is the fourth country I'm living in. So, but anyway, that's that's pretty much it. Thanks, Kate. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, look, I would really, um, I really hate to hear that people are feeling that they are in a um, in a such a competitive world that they're fighting. You know, uh, I think that that's a really, and I'm not, I'm not um, suggesting for a moment that you're not feeling, um, feeling that in your situation. Um, I suppose I think I, I can't, you know, sort of comment specifically on that. Um, I think there is always in in a workplace there will always be that um, level of competition about who's who who um, feels that they have more of a, um, um, a a right than others because of longevity. But I would think that you know one can have ten years experience and you're still not necessarily able to meet the criteria for um, you know a, you, the broad range criteria. So I think I would say to to candidates be really strategic in the way you actually operate in the workplace in terms of thinking about being really clear about it's not just two years experience it's is looking at specific experience in specific areas so really look at how you can actually build your um your profile um, um in that in that line um any advice on how to address this like do i address it over a coffee because honestly I, i'm seeing that melanie thank you for the response it's it's great to take it to the director but also i also feel that you should pick your battles very wisely and i don't want to take a small issue like that to a director it is a small issue in the sense that it's like oh this is part of navigating everyday life and i feel like there must be a way to sort of address it in a reasonable way and say hey look we are all in this together We'll all get there together, and I think we help each other if we do it together. But you know, I'm just asking for advice, really, because I'm sure you've got a you know heaps more advice with a lot of different kind of people. Um, from from my perspective, I'd actually throw that to someone who's worked to people who are working in architectural firms, um, Naomi and. Mm -hmm. Justine, I think. Well, in fact, Melanie is doing a fantastic job here. <laughs> I can't actually like read the chat, I'm sorry. Um, so. We will say thank you to Melanie. And also, um, uh, what, what have you got to say about this, Melanie, this particular rather subtle and pretty tricky question? Um, I think I'm off mute. Uh, look, I, I think it's, it's a challenge. I think in an office where you have, I, I don't know how big your office is um, that you're working in, Badru, but uh, I know that in many small practices where directors and maybe senior associates, whatever, are very active in working with graduates on projects and, you know, I'm, I'm seeing in my own practice and I've seen for many years, um, I guess, because I'm very proactive about it, but I do hear about this happening in other practices, is that people take, uh, make efforts to spread the tasks and the opportunities on different projects um, as evenly as possible. It's never going to be perfect. Um, but I think, you know, it's, I know you said, you know, you feel that it's a small matter and it maybe is something that you should be negotiating, but I, I actually would beg to differ. And I say, actually, it's not a small matter because it's getting in the way of you getting your experience. Um, and maybe, like I said, the, the director, I don't know, again, I don't know how big the practice, but maybe the director or the senior architect, whoever is blissfully unaware that maybe they, they need to. And I look, I hear this from many graduates that they, they're not sure whether they can pipe up about these things in practice. And I actually think, yep, it can be very difficult and you don't want to jeopardise the goodwill or the relationships in the practice. But ultimately, you have to think about your own experience, your registration, your own career. And sometimes, unfortunately, you just have to stand up for yourself and have a difficult conversation or a conversation you might feel is difficult simply because people are just not aware. They're not thinking that way. And it's unfortunate but but it does happen and I, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard these stories over many years of being um, an examiner and doing talks for Reg of Frustration and now I'm the convener in New South Wales and I, I hear these things all the time and so I, I know it's hard for graduates to do that but I just want to encourage you all, give you the spirit of encouragement to have the hard conversations because you might find that actually it, it opens up opportunities and, and it maybe it actually helps the whole practice work better um that's my i'm oh, happy to i'll just you. go back to the chat now and shut no, up no, th thank <laughs> you thank you that's a lovely response that thank you i think i needed to like you said listen to the right voices I'm listening I to wonder if it's worth, 
Naomi, is it worth um, throwing to Carolyn Napier here, who, who's, who's been through this herself and found a way through it? Um, uh, Carolyn, I don't, are you available to, to tell us about your experience? <coughs> Yeah, I don't know if my mic works very well. So if you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, <laughs> so I uh, have put my logbook in at the start of this year and it passed. Um, so I'm kind of stuck in a bit of a holding pattern at the moment. But I struggled kind of, I graduated only two years ago and I struggled probably for the first 12 months to actually get put on construction admin and also like bidding on projects. So my first point of call was just to go to, I work with one architect quite closely and I kind of raised with him that I wanted to go for registration. I basically said I want to be registered within 24 to 100, what, 26 months, 30 months was kind of my time frame. And they were, there was kind of a transition that said, yep, yeah, okay, we'll try and like, get you the tasks that you need to do that. Um, and in doing that, I realized that I needed support because I need help to study and motivated to do that. And part of that was we have quite a lot of graduates. So we have a online chat system with our office. We set up a page that's just got all of the graduates included in it. And basically anything that we find at PALS, anything that comes up at our projects, we can kind of put them in that chat area and everyone has access to it. And it's quite good then to be able to talk about what's happening on my project or what I'm working on and share that with people who probably haven't had that experience yet. So that's internal. Um, probably haven't had as much experience trying to get it to talk to people at other firms because I also work on a particular type of building and I'd like to learn more about what other people are doing and other firms to or what experiences they're having at different project stages. So I don't know if there's another avenue potentially that we could go down um, that a bigger group of people, like a, a group or something like that, where we share more information, if that's something that could support a lot of people, because it sounds like most people aren't being supported. I know in, in Adelaide, the ACA runs a um, registration study group, which is set different to Pals and Park, which I think actually quite actively you know, teach. Um, and this is simply a platform where people get together and you know, support each other in studying. And, and as an organisation, the ACA facilitates that. And I've always thought that seemed like a really great idea. Um, um, so I wonder if there's ways to kind of try and set something like that up. Um, you know, in, in other places. And now that we're all online, we can all do, you know, we don't need to be bound by our geography. Um, so maybe that's something that we might all think about how we well, could. I wonder, Justine, whether we could talk to our friend and Angelina Pillai at the ACA and because um, there's no reason why an Adelaide based group couldn't become a national group, for example. Yeah. I mean, yeah without wanting to commit them to anything that they haven't committed themselves to. I know, I'm, I'm resisting committing Parlour to something, but, you know, I can feel myself leaping in. Well, there would need to be moderation and so forth, so there would be some uh, work yeah. involved. But, look, I'm just aware that we've got three minutes until oh. we, um, our time is complete, and we've had some excellent questions, which we unfortunately are not going to have time to come to. But um, I feel like this chat is going to be a fantastic um, resource for Kate and for everybody else. Um, Justine, what do you want to do for, maybe we can take one more question? Yes, one, maybe one more, com one, one more question that kind of goes to Kate's, um, Kate's question to you all about really where are the kind of barriers that, and, and how might we, they start, the ACA start to address those, so. We could uh, go to Thea. Thea has a, 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 bar a specific barrier. Thea, do you want to put your question? Maybe we've lost Thea. The, uh, the, um, the barrier, I can just say it, pipe in Thea if you join us. Um, the barrier is the assumption that graduates are young. More a mature age entry, this is a career change and graduating in, people are graduating in their 40s and 50s, I think. Um, the current climate of employment opportunities, people being time poor, um, and the necessity of taking a role, any role, which is related to, the, to architecture. Um, can experience and tasks not gained in an architecture practice be used? 
Um, the answer is yes, and it's very, we, we deal with that. The, the, we're getting an increasing number of um, um, gr uh, applications for the architecture practice exam where some or, or sometimes in some cases even all of their experience logged is not gained under the supervision of an architect. So absolutely, yes. Um, I think it doesn't matter. It, I don't think the age profile, mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole range of other reasons, you know, sort of life experience, but in terms of the performance criteria, it's not impacting um, on the um, on the process. I know there are some people who who are very keen to come to, to apply to the APE within the 12 months post graduation because of extensive experience they've had, and boards will look at that on a case by case basis. If I can just, um, I'm conscious of time, so I think um, yes, there is a there is an enormous amount of flexibility for anyone doing the APE. They should really look at our frequently asked questions which are actually answers to questions that people have asked us or have asked the boards over the last year or so. Um, and our website um, information on all of our other programs. We have detailed, um, two detailed sem um, webinars on the EPA and the OQA respectively. But if I could just say one of the things that we're doing at the moment, we have uh, two major projects that we're doing which impact everybody in architecture. One is the review of the National Standard of Architecture. And I would in, uh, um, encourage everyone to watch the, the process in that um, that's happening there and make a personal response to, to there's an issues paper out at the moment mm -hmm. and then um, participate later in the year. But we're also doing another project on how we can better support graduates on the path to registration because some of the things that I think it was Thea saying or Carolyn, I'm not, I'm not sure, um, about how difficult it is to get access to some of that experience, particularly around um, contract admin um, procurement and some of the project delivery aspects. And so we're looking at, and again, one of the models that we're looking at is, is encouraging a mentorship um, um, model, not that they have to pay anyone to go and do another new thing, but to actually in work that's already happening. So the model that ACA rolls out in South Australia, the AIA has a um, head of the mentorship um, program, some employers, have it. So we're looking at trying to use what is already there, but to reflect back on what are the, um, the barriers in specific programs um, and then across, um, for in terms of women across um, all of the programs, we take that into account as well. So, um, and the last um, advertisement I would have is, I'm sure Justine, if I can say that as well, is um, the, um, the very important survey that's out at the moment. Um, mm. So I'm just saying that as a matter of course, I've got that in my notes, the, everything I'm doing at the moment, I'm doing lots of briefings at the moment, is um, please um, answer the um, survey on wellbeing in architecture that's coming at you from a number of sources at the moment. Yep, great. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Kate. I think Laura Harding's got a really great question here, but we're kind of over time. Does it... <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy to Laura, take it if some. Um, yeah. It's a very provocative question. Laura, do you want to just put it very quickly and succinctly and we'll we'll make it the last one? Laura. Yeah. Uh, we can't hear you just yet. No. Try again. Sorry, I wasn't expecting to speak. Um, <laughs> it's just coming from experience in a practice where we, we do, we've people have tried several times and it's absolutely impossible for us to comply with the registration experience requirements despite our um, desire and the support from the practice to do so. So I'm just wondering, um, but it's because our experience Sorry. of architecture is much more broad. And I wonder if the, the board's ever considered two categories, one that's um, maybe registered and uh, can encompass people like Justine or people who have a much broader contribution to make. And um, as, a, as aside from maybe chartered architects who of, of course have a, a, a different legal responsibility, but as a way of just being more inclusive about the skills that um, architecture mm. might want to keep within the team. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good question and goes to the heart of um, what the purpose of um, regulation is. It goes to the heart of what we're talking about at the moment in the um, review of the National Standard of Competency. So, Laura, I'd suggest that you put in a, in, um, have a look at that um, because the performance, the national standard underpins all of our um, programs. I also think the other thing that we're looking at in this better support for um, graduates is we're also looking at maybe the potential for um, for substituting some of the experience required in the APE 
um, in terms of those areas where a graduate is finding it difficult to gain experience and replace that with some kind of um, formal learning program. Um, so that might be um, uh, uh, that might be well of interest. And that would that the recommendations from that program going to the the annual meeting of architect registration boards in September October. So we are conscious of the fact, Laura, that there are people who are operating in the broad space of um, architectural services relating to buildings and spaces, um, and who might not, but not might be not not but not might be able to have some of those um, meet some of those very specific performance criteria because of the range of services they provide. So again, that's that's because we've been well. We know we've, we've changed, that practice has changed so much, particularly in the last five years. So we are, and the boards are very live to that issue as well. Even though it mightn't sound like it, sometimes. I, sorry, that didn't mean sound that rude about the board. I didn't mean that. I just mean because we are looking still at the architecture practice exam as it has been for the last, you know, 15 years. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you. Kate, take it away, Justine. You're going to wrap it up? Yep, sure. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everybody. I've, I feel like this has been an incredibly productive session in that chat session, and we will... Um, make a transcript of that available to Kate. So if people have got more feedback for Kate, yep. um, I'm sure they can just find Kate through the AACA website. Yep. Um, Absolutely. So you're very welcome to send things to, to us here at Parlour and we can forward them on. Um, and this is, a, you know, obviously an ongoing discussion and, and I'm also very interested to think more about that kind of informal support and how... Um, you know, this great conversation that's happening in that chat forum, mm. that might, how we might take that forward. So thank you very much for everyone coming. Um, we've got quite a lot on at Parlour at the moment. As Kate said, we have finally launched the survey, which I've told you about for the last two weeks. It is, um, uh, we're getting lots and lots of responses, which is great. It is very, it is long. So, um, and I know that puts some people off, but all I can say is, Get yourself a cup of tea, sit down there tonight with a glass of wine, whatever. Take the time to do it. It is long because we actually really want to, we want to gather enough data that we can make a really meaningful analysis. So we need to know what your situation was before COVID. We need to know what it's been like during COVID. And we really are very interested to know in where and how you think um, things can change, what, what, what's changed for the better that we might want to take forward. So it is a detailed, it's detailed, but there's, it's pretty much, you know, tick box. So it's not, it, it's detailed, but we really would appreciate it if you um, can do that. And also please pass it on. Looking at the responses, we've got a really fantastic turnout from, from women between 30 and 50. Um, we really need the men to be taking it too. So do the survey. And I, if I can encourage you to pass it on to just one more person and encourage them to do it too, that would be great because that would be a really good way of getting it out beyond our networks. Um, hey, Justine, you could yeah. paste the link into the chat field. Oh, I could. Whoa. <laughs> me, imagine that would be technologically astounding, wouldn't that? Let me, um, I've got actually, that would involve having the link ready. Sorry, I'm, um, I'm just going to keep talking while I do that. So we have got our next um, online salon next Thursday evening. I think that's going to be really great. We've got that with Loata Ho and Kali Manane. Um, so book in for that. We've still got spaces for that. Um, we also, you probably all got email spam from me this morning asking for money. Um, <laughs> it's the end of the financial year, so we are... Um, doing our usual um, please support us donate by donating and becoming a parlor friend. I know that it's a difficult time for people and we understand that not everybody is in a position to donate, but if you are, please do. Um, all of the stuff we do is made possible because of our partners who I talk about a lot, but also our friends. Um, and we really um, actually do need uh, to be able to continue that, we need fight to be able to finance it. So thank you for everybody who's donated so far. Again, if you can do, encourage your practice to donate. So this is not just about individuals. Yeah, you know, just strong arm anyone you can to give us some cash. <laughs> um, so thanks again to Monash. Thanks to our pile of partners, um, in particular AWS. Um, 
Oh, the other thing we are looking at doing is setting up a sort of um, fairly informal, even more informal than this even, kind of online um, get together for students and recent graduates in particular, and that's being led by um, Sarah Mayer and Bronwyn Main, and so we'll be announcing details about that soon. Um, great. <laughs> Should we do the round of applause? Thank you very much, Kate. That was fantastic. Your time is precious. Thanks for coming. Good. Cool. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Happy Friday, everyone. <laughs>